Frederick, you found with data that combining intravitreal injection of anti-VGF with a, uh, no, sorry. Uh, next uh, step is uh, micropulse laser, I think, normally, if I'm right. Yes, thank you. <laughs> and now let's speak about micropulse 577. Is this a perfect second line treatment for macular edema? So, what's the best choice? This, microburst, or more and more repetition of multiple IVTs? Well, what's up with microburst? Remember, nowadays, usual practice with macular edema. OCT picture, this is eligible to IVT protocol with multiple IVTs, result with OCT picture, and so on. That IVT paradigm is based on macular edema decrease quickly after IVT. And if macular edema is persistent or recurrent, the man, the bad guy, the man with a lot of IVTs in his hands will do another IVT or a lot of IVTs. For other treatment, problem often is that macular edema decrease slowly. And if macular edema is persistent or recurrent, what to do? So, are you ready to follow microburst complexity? In fact, it's easy to confuse microburst with pattern laser. I'm afraid a lot of ophthalmologists think that it's similar, but it's not. Microburst is a train of very short laser pulses, which avoids temperature elevation, and there is no burns. See that. And microburst is definitely not a conventional laser. Microburst is an optional function for some laser. Pattern laser use shorter pulses, than conventional laser, but remain continuous pulses, and it burns a little. See those small movies on the slide. See how pattern and microburst are different, but can combine. On the left, see pattern laser green, conventional. That is continuous pulse. Just in the middle, see pattern, I'm sorry. See those small movies on the slide. See how pattern and microburst are different that can combine. On the left, see pattern laser green conventional. That is continuous pulse. Just in the middle, see pattern laser yellow conventional. It's still continuous pulse. And on the right, pattern laser yellow microburst. That is not continuous pulses. But let's see now microburst guideline to use it right. This resume all you need to use it right. First advice, large spots are better, no thermal effect, so it allows safe confluent treatment, no gaps between treatment spots. Succeeding an efficient therapeutic treatment means a dense treatment. You must treat all the area of macular edema and often all the macula. Use of larger spots help to decrease time required for treatments. Nowadays, settings for usual microburst are duty cycle 5%, Exposure time 200 milliseconds. To titrate power selection, you just test, test a single spot, gradually reach a barely visible burn in a normal area of retina near the macular edema. Then, reduce power to 50% for treatment. Second advice for grid. Remember, no laser spots are visible, so this grid pattern can help in placement of spots. Aiming being is positioning for they are referenced, and you can start grid each sector one after one. Third trick for squares. When you cannot use a macular grid, or if you rather use squares, use this pattern. Each spot takes 200 milliseconds, which means for 25 spots, five to six seconds. Fourth trick is resume function for safety. It takes time for, to, for an effective dance treatment, and patients sometimes move during it. This is why resume function is very useful. As treatment is invisible, just remember where, where the last laser spot is located on the macula. If passion moves, stop and realign the last laser spot and finish the treatment safely, like that. And a third, and it's finished. Sorry. Here is our experience, retrospective clinical trial evaluation between February 2011 and December 2015. 
Mean follow-up 33 months, range 655. All were difficult cases, mainly because of macular edema recurrence. All had surgery. Then several IVTs, anti-VGF, corticosteroid, or combined. Then microbursts. Here, I excluded all patients which didn't have had prior ILM peeling compared to previous presentations. We didn't begin first with a very low duty cycle and try several different, 15, 9, and now 5%. It was surprisingly efficient for these difficult eyes. Majority of patients had visual acuity improve or stabilize, and CMT and OCT decreased too for majority. But some important advice remain. Success needs time. Microbursts need delay to be effective, one to three months. You must tell your patient this, and you must keep it in mind. Several microbursts often needed a thick macular edema, so it increased delay for final result. Learning curve was a problem, but now you know how to use microbursts right. Do a lot of spots, large spots, treat dense with no gaps, especially with 5% duty cycle. Remember that our actual experience in my, in my, is micropulse in third line after ILIM peeling first and IVT second. But anyway, I think that if macular edema is less than 400 <coughs> microns, micropulse should be possible in second line before any IVT. If, micropulse, if macular edema is more than 400, try anti-VHF IVT, then micropulse if necessary, then wait and check visual acuity. If macular edema decreases more, wait or do second micropulse. If reluctant, do another IVT. We don't have experience without surgery in first line, but it should be the same. Clearly, 400 microns seems to go to use micropulse easily and with better hopes of success. To conclude, was not the market challenge for micropulse. In fact, the market is wide. Diabetic, RVO, even AMD perhaps, in case of polypoid vasculopathy or anastomosis, for example, or perhaps for treatment revival of CNV feeder vessels in the future. Who knows? The best place anyway is if there are a lot of macular edema recurrence or reluctance to IVTs. Because ophthalmologists and patients are sometimes fed up with multiple IVTs, there is place for alternative treatments such microbes. Till now, balance clearly is in the IVT side. See the slide. Big pharma, more and more protocols, more and more IVTs, more and more elders, more and more users of IVTs. So list of users increase and market of IVTs is very attractive. But on the other side, see consider, considerable improvement of microbes better standardization for reproductibility, advantages of a non-damaging treatment with repeatable option. The challenge is to find more users, develop the good timing to do microbursts in order to improve results. Curious thing is that microbursts seems to be trend today, something like a new cool treatment. All of this makes me think that microbursts is perhaps the perfect second line treatment for macular edema. That's my conclusion and that's all false. Thank you very much. On your side, Stefan, you also want to show some benefits related to micropulse laser in cases of diffuse diabetic macular edema. You particularly emphasize the interest of measuring the right things in front of our diabetic patients. We are listening to you. Thank you. Focal grid laser has been a standard of our care for now almost three decades, oh, more than three decades. From the ETDRS, currently through the DRCR uh, T network, uh, DRCR network uh, T trials, it's demonstrated improvement in focal edema, but no improvement in vision when the laser is used alone in uh, edema that involves the fovea. The primary leakage, however, we must realize is not focal. It is due to telangiectasia that's aggravated by the local retinal ischemia, has been pointed out by a number of the prior speakers. The vision has always been measured by using the ETDRS chart. This does not evaluate the devastating effects of focal laser when it's been applied in the past using continuous wave lasers, because that laser light is absorbed primarily 95% by the 
retinal pigment epithelium and the pigment in the choriocapillaris. And this leads to injury to the photoreceptors that expands with time. What Martin Mainster and I have shown is that these lesions expand 300 to 500 percent when using the standard 0.1 uh, second, 100 milliseconds of laser light. And you as you can see here in the two right hand uh, pictures, the laser spots that were applied one year, three years, five years, um, they expand progressively with time to produce these devastating effects around the fovea. Although the visual acuity is 20-20, the devastating effects make these eyes severely impaired in their functionality. So therefore, diffuse macular edema that involves the, the, the fovea is untreatable by primarily using focal continuous wave laser. What about micropulse laser? As Frederick has just pointed out, this has multiple advantages. It's significant improvement in the diabetic retinopathy edema and acuity at frequencies that are similar to traditional continuous wave laser treatment, as we've shown in others, but with absolutely no evidence of tissue injury when the 5% duty cycle is used. However you measure it, by OCT, by autofluorescence, by whatever, even years and years and years later, there's no evidence of any laser injury. So there's su suggested improvements in the vision when the vision is measured by either um, perimetry measurements or by um, multifocal ERG. So this suggests that we are indeed providing a cytokine improvement, a healing mechanism to the retina that improves the edema, as Frederick has pointed out, when used in a non-injury way. So what about the diffuse laser uh, use in uh, diffuse macular edema types of, uh, especially with diabetic macular edema? I want to point out two studies that we have recently done. The first is very early uh, treatment. This is a retrospective review of consecutive cases that had severe diffuse diabetic macular edema in which the fovea was involved, and this failed all diffuse other methods of treatment. The micropulse laser that's used is a 5% duty cycle, 200 microns, 920 milliwatts. Uh, the important thing here is that it's 5% duty cycle. I reported on this yesterday. This uses a painting contiguous wave. Often we're applying a thousand or more spots within the macula. And often it does require retreatment. This study that I'm uh, pointing out right here, the outcomes were um, after three month intervals with using not only best corrected visual acuity, but spectral domain OCT, fluorescein angiography, and two new things that I would like to report, the omni field, which is the first ever acuity visual field, and the IVFQ. This is a, um, the any IVFQ that's provided on an iPad that patients can complete when they're waiting in the waiting room to see the doctor. And it tells something about the functionality of the patient that, uh, that uh, we cannot obtain by just doing acuity measurements alone. As far as the omni field, the acuity visual field, I'm going to report three measures. First is the acuity at fixation. The second is the best acuity with any one of the intercepts that are measured throughout the central visual field. This is a 20 degree, 10 degree um, uh, um, radius 20 degree diameter visual field. So the best acuity within that often matches the chart acuity because what patients are doing with this Swiss cheese vision caused by the macular edema is moving their eye around until they can center the chart over that best central area of vision. So this best acuity within six degrees often um, matches that. The best measure, however, I think is the global macular acuity, which is the average of the acuities thresholded at all the intercepts. And this gives us th really the best correlation with functionality. All right, just very quickly, the, this is 78 eyes that uh, we reviewed. Again, a single cohort. These had been f patients that had that failed all other modes of treatment. That is, they had no vision improvement with multiple intravitreal um, uh, anti-VEGFs or steroids, often uh, following vitrectomy, all of these things had failed. So these are end stage types of eyes. The overwhelming majority here from 69 to 71%, the 
vision was stable, whether you measured it with the chart, the best acuity at six degrees, or the global macular acuity. But there was an improvement of logmar 0.2 to logmar 0.3, three lines, in upwards of about um, uh, 18 to 20 percent. There was a decrease um, of these patients um, that was only very minimal, uh, varying between about 8 and 14 percent. How about the thickness? Well, we looked at changes in thickness of 100 microns or more. Again, most of these eyes, 50% or so, remain stable uh, for the follow-up of more than a year. But about 30% improved no matter how you measured those um, cyst sizes, outer nuclear layer cysts, middle nuclear layer cysts, or the total thickness or extra macular thickness, extra foveal thickness. Um, about a third, uh, 25 to 30% improved but about uh, 25 to 30% also worsened. So here are just a couple of examples of diffuse macular edema here. You see that it's the telangiectatic leakage which creates the greatest degree of leakage around the fovea, and a number of animal models have been shown to be the greatest cause of the amount of fluid leakage in lipoprotein deposit. Here is the OCT that demonstrates the parafoveal cysts and the peripheral, more peripheral exudates. And most of these cysts are in the outer nuclear layer. You see some destruction of the photoreceptor ellipsoid uh, junction, but it's only just fragmented. Here is the acuity visual field demonstrating that the central uh, foveal acuity, in spite of the cysts, was 20-20 with a very good acuity overall, even though there were defects that came in toward the center. After micropulse grid laser, the, you can see that some of the leakage compared to the one above on the far right is improved a small amount. The, the thickness was improved significantly in terms of the cyst size, but look at the improvement of the acuity visual field going from many areas, the lighter, the whiter are closer to the 2020, whereas the darker are much worse. That same defect, though, remained, although it did improve in terms of its um, central um, uh, uh, effect. Here's the worst of the worst. This is an eye that has had long-standing macular edema associated with significant areas of ischemia, epiretinal membrane, all of the worst, um, with associated also outer retinal and um, uh, severe cystoid contiguous edema, the epiretinal membrane, and the subretinal fluid. Here are the devastating effects going down to 2200, 2400 in the central axis as well as surrounding it. And after micropulse laser, little improvement, if anything, in the edema. And the OCT remains still severely disrupted. So basically no effect, a little bit here and there, but still severe defects, uh, even in spite of the micropulse laser. Here's a, a third case in which there was previously applied multiple continuous wave grid laser applications in an effort to try to control the diffuse edema. And here you see, oh, there's not that much edema that remains, but look at all the pock marks in the photoreceptor ellipsoid junction that demonstrate the effects of the laser treatment. Here are the defects periaxial of the micro, um, uh, of the uh, omni field, showing acuity defects. There are four and five standard deviations from normal. Micropulse laser, uh, here, these are caused by the autofluorescence showing the, this is, again, not the micropulse, but this with the prior applied continuous wave grid laser applied multiple times over multiple years. And when micropulse was done, improvement in the edema, but the defects left in the visual field are still those of the prior laser photocoagulation. So, in conclusion, with these 74 eyes uh, that we followed for more than a year after micropulse laser in eyes that had failed everything else, there was a significant improvement in edema with 90, uh, excuse me, with 50 percent of those remaining stable, but about 22 to 30 percent improving in vision and improving in the edema in terms of middle nuclear and outer nuclear cystoid changes, but they required multiple treatments combined with ongoing uh, pharmaceutical injections. Significant vision improvement of Logmar 0.3, about 18 to 25 percent, 
and but I have to point out that this was not related to improvement in the central axis thickness, or um, but it was related to the foveal cyst size. But there was a wide scatter even among those suggesting that there were other determinants of this vision. The better vision prognosis were those that had an intact visual acuity to begin with, with minimal defects in the uh, omni field, intact epiretinal um, uh, external limiting membrane and photoreceptor ellipsoid junction, and if they had predominantly outer nuclear layer cysts, these were the better vision prognosis, whereas uh, excuse me, if, if the, those outer nuclear layer cysts were relatively small, if those outer nuclear layer cysts were central and very large, it was a much poorer prognosis. Middle nuclear layer cystoid changes were much better prognosis. The poor visual prognosis were those in which there was defects in those um, outer limiting photoreceptor um, uh, bands, and uh, if there were very thick outer nuclear layer cystoid, or certainly if there was notching of the, of the uh, FAZ as pointed out by Sengel earlier. And certainly if you had worse hemoglobin A1C, if you had nephropathy associated with anemia or sleep apnea, et cetera, these were associated with a worse prognosis. What are my recommendations? I'm gonna close this conference by trying to summarize everybody's statements here. <laughs> One is that if we wait and wait and wait at the, to, uh, using physician, examina physician examiner examinations as our criteria for screening, we're way too late. I think that screening should be done by any kind of, of um, any diabetic with any microangiopathy using uh, sc spectral domain OCT, and we have to use some better methods of vision measurement so we can pick up the earliest neuronopathy as well as the microangiopathy. In other words, we've primarily focused our treatment and our focus on the microangiopathy, but there's a parallel neuronopathy which is destroying the vision of our patients. We cannot wait for clinically significant macular edema. It's way too late. We have to begin earlier. And I would suggest, even maybe, as Frederick has suggested, very early, beginning with micropulse laser. It's a totally non-invasive, non-injurious treatment. How early do you begin? Again, using 5% duty cycle. If you don't have micropulse laser, perhaps using standard laser, but again, it was, has been pointed out or will be pointed out uh, by Vladimir that you have to use very, 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 very light subthreshold treatment. And I recommend that you stay at least one disc diameter peripheral to the fovea, which means you can't treat foveal involved edema. We have to stop using best corrected visual acuity because it does not measure vision. We've used it for 180 years but it does not measure vision. And we have to stop using central retinal thickness as our trial endpoints. We have to use acuity perimetry or micro, or uh, examine these subcomponents. That's what I was gonna to reply to the fellow from Kenya. We have to use these subcomponents of the SDOCT in order to really analyze where we are with each patient and to, uh, to analyze where the potential is for improving not only the edema, but also the vision. In the final analysis, you won't know whether the vision is improved unless you measure the vision. The central field of vision, since our patients really have this Swiss cheese type of central vision loss, we have to measure that in some way, either using it with microperimetry or with this um, acuity perimetry, but we also have to remember that our patients function under different environments, mesopic and photopic, that we have to mimic when we're analyzing for that vision. Finally, oh, I Thank you. I'll quit there. Vladimir, um, we are running out of, of time. Uh, on your side, you compared the effectiveness of laser to nepafenac molecule. Please show us your results. Uh, thank you very much. So I will speak uh, about one really unusual way of treating the diabetic macular macular edema. So there are several, several risk factors that can break the blood retinal barrier and cause the, the macular edema. So the common denominator of all of them is the inflammation. So the standard therapeutic options for diabetic macular edema are the photocoagulation and intravitreal injections. So although considered safe and effective, these drugs may have serious complications at ocular and systemic level. 
but in recent research for its pharmaceutical characteristics, we can see that the topical route has been considered unsuitable for treating the retinal diseases, but nepafenac, as we can see, has been considered as a drug capable of reaching the retina in concentration sufficient to produce beneficial effects. For that reason, we had designed a study that, um, as, as I can say, in which we investigated the effect in the patients with diffuse or mixed diabetic macular edema. Here are the exclusion and inclusion criteria. We evaluated three clinical concepts, visual acuity, central macular thickness, and volume. The first group was treated with focal photocoagulation, a low intensity threshold impacts, and the second group with nepafenac eye drops three times a day. This is the table of results. We treated 10 eyes with nepafenac and 13 with laser. The demographic parameters were homogeneous and comparable between the two, the two, the two groups. Uh, the mean follow-up, given the, the light effect of laser, was 7.3 months in the first group and 4.3 months in the second one. First analyzed parameter was the visual acuity. Patients treated with laser presented an initial visual acuity of 0 0.46 with significant and worsening of 0 0.53. In the study group, treated with nepafenac, the visual acuity worsened insignificantly from 0, uh, 0 0.42 to 0 0.44. The second of the investigative parameters was the central thickness. If the photocoagulated patients, uh, the thick, in the photocoagulated patients, the thickness improved on average more than 100 microns. In the study group, it also improved from 356 to 292 microns. And this thickness reduction was also significant in both groups. The third parameter, the macular vol volume, as we know is an indicator of dispersion and magnitude of the macular edema was also studied. The first group showed a volume decrease from 11.2 to 10.3 cube millimeters. Patients receiving nepafenac also improved from 11 to 10.47 cube millimeters. Like the central thickness, the volume was significantly improved in both groups. The data of the existence of an effective topical treatment as nepafenac gained more importance at this moment when the current Vitoretinal Society guidelines of the Spanish uh, Society published recently that etaderese, clinic, clinically significant macular edema, is removed in official, in official disuse and changed by macular edema with or without central involvement. Now, the first choice are the intravitreal injections and the laser stays as adjuvant. In fact, the only indication for treating with focal laser is a focal leak. Uh, the vitri uh, the um, microorganisms away from the center with lipid deposits. About the effectiveness of the anti-VGF drugs, look the data from DRCR protocol T. Although in the first year each patient received nine or ten intravitreal injections, in between one third and one half of the studied patients did not improve or worsened the diabetic macular edema. Over two years, the results were very similar. Rescue laser treatment was applied in all groups between 41 and 64 percent of studied patients. It's really a huge number. Also, they published the systemic adverse events, 
notice that one in each four patients had serious events. Over two years, APTC events were between 5 and 12 percent. The topical treatment with nepofen with, nepo with nepofenac, sorry, have not any of these risks. The first results were surprisingly good. The drug has potent effect on retinal inflammation. Although incomplete, the resolution of edema is important and sustained over the time. Attention to the pro-inflammatory effect of the prostaglandins. The study patient used them for a long time. The nepafenac instilled in both eye, eyes for four months reduced very, very little the diabetic macular edema. In conclusion, in our study, nepafenac has been shown to be clinically effective and safe treatment, able to stabilize the blood retinal barrier and thereby reduce diabetic macular edema. The, the visual benefit was better in patients treated with nepafenac than with laser photostimulation. Thank you very much.